All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll say that it's time and as much fun as I have talking to the panelists, I think you would appreciate it more if I do it while mic'd and actually on topic. <laughs> Today's topic, as much as anything else, is can be just simply summed up as California and innovation are essential partners. California is the state in the country that embraces change in a way that no other state truly does. Sometimes a change, uh, change is forced on us. Obviously, San Francisco got a little redecorating in 1906. Sometimes it happens because the economy transforms uh, due to unforeseen circumstances. I mean, if Thomas Edison hadn't gotten into a uh, patent dispute with a bunch of garment makers who wanted to make their own movies, Hollywood wouldn't have happened. Uh, it, the aerospace industry happened because it was, a strategic, uh, it was a location at the time, amazingly enough, that had cheap land, it had talent, it had good weather. Uh, Silicon Valley happened because as much as anything else, you had risk takers and you had uh, a university in Stanford and then other universities as well that helped to provide the ideas and the means to make it happen. But California is no longer uh, a state that is the only one desperately trying to embrace change to be the innovator everywhere around the world. You hear who's going to be the next Silicon Valley, who's going to be the next California, and you repeatedly hear people saying, well, hey, you know, California isn't that state, isn't that the state with the financial troubles, isn't that the state that's got uh, all, you know, the regulatory issues, isn't that the state with all sorts of other things going on, and yet California is still the greatest center of innovation. We have the, uh, the, the UC University system is the single greatest patent generating engine in the world, and it's not even close. And we have an incredible amount of talent, and we have a culture that directly brings companies to work here in, in research and development and other key elements, whether they're based elsewhere whether they're based here and they work with people overseas, whether they work with people in other parts of the country, California remains essential to the innovation process, not just for the United States, but for Asia, for Europe, for Latin America, and elsewhere. And what we're going to do today is that we're going to talk about why innovation remains essential for California's identity, who the competitors are that California really needs to worry about, and what are the issues that California itself needs to overcome and how it can be overcome. This is meant to be a positive panel for those of you who are familiar with the Global Conference. Yes, we periodically have our uh, moments of negativity and you always have a little bit of that, but we are interested in solutions and we are interested in ideas that we can push forward. And that's what we're doing here today. What I'm going to do briefly is go alphabetically through uh, my uh, uh, wonderful panelists starting with Darren Jamison, who represents a, a couple key elements in this regard. He represents energy, literally and figuratively, and he represents, in, as the CEO of Capstone Turbine, a company that manufactures, that designs, and is involved in very high technology and complex operations. And he can talk about both the, uh, and will talk about, how being in California affects his company and his experience. Next to me is uh, Joe Chiani, who is a man who is very passionate about health, about safety, and medical devices. And he's been the CEO of Massimo and has been involved in safety, uh, patient safety and innovation in healthcare for more than 20 years. And he can talk exactly about what it is that drew him into California and what it is that keeps him here uh, despite everything else. <laughs> uh, next to me is the gentleman who secretly is actually an entrepreneur, Gavin Newsom. He, yes, you know, he, you know, he goes around, he plays the politician by day, but by night he actually still owns and is involved in a number of different companies, in double digits in fact, and it has something to do with his plump jack. Yeah, some wine in restaurants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, you know, so he, he can actually... Uh, he can actually innovate, he can actually market. He's not just a politician, but we're going to definitely yeah. uh, talk about the fact that uh, you, you've, you've been uh, dealing with the, uh, the, the various uh, barriers and trying to cut through them, and, uh, and also the fact that you're an author now. So All right. we'll drag Thank on you. that, too. This is good. Yeah, so, you know, I'm, at this rate, you know, I'm going to have the wholesale pitch yeah. done. 
<laughs> Talk about my wife and kids. Yeah, I know. Well, we'll do that too. We'll say that, you know, among the greatest innovations you can have are having kids, you know, and uh, raising them. Uh, that's, uh, that's where the ideas come from. Uh, then we've got uh, Kim Polese, and uh, um, I will, uh, who is not only the Silicon Valley veteran, but also is the entrepreneur, the person who has helped to curse our browsers with Java once upon a time, <laughs> and, uh, and is also our, uh, a, a passionate individual when it comes to education, the future of human capital in the state. And then over uh, beyond, at the, at, the, uh, at the far end, is our distinguished European sage, Peter Plasser, who is the man who has been everywhere. He has been to Europe, he has been to Asia, and he has been successful in all of these places, and yet he's in California, and we will find out why. Mm. And in fact, I would actually like to start out that way. Sure. Is that you had a chance when you were uh, uh, first off in that uh, you've got a, well, I would love to have you describe a little about why you did uh, started Nano Satisfy and why in California? Yeah, so I've been, I've been always passionate about space. It's just uh, back in the days, it was, it was only government, it was very, very slow. And then in 2009, when I was at Singularity University, um, Peter Diamandis and I had a lot of conversations, and it became apparent that there is now a breaking up of those encrusted structures. And that then led me to start Nano Satisfy. So we, we built satellites um, on a new standard called CubeSats. And we let students program and control the satellite for a whole week. Uh, we give them a curriculum to have a true hands-on science experience. So similar to you, I'm very passionate about education. Um, it has brought me where I am today. Um, and given that I lived in various places in Europe and in Asia and the US, um, I was uh, very open to starting that company in, their, in different locations. So we looked at uh, Munich, we looked at Vienna, we looked at Strasbourg, um, we looked at um, uh, New York, uh, we looked at California, and started discussions in, in all of those places. And to start a company, I mean, you know significantly more about that than me, but you need, you need capital, you need people, and you, you need an environment that is willing to take a big of a risk, right? I mean, it's not that starting a space company sounds like you do that in an afternoon. And the best place to find it was California. And we're very glad for that. Although I, am, I will say that I am deeply inspired by the Strasbourg idea. I think the marketing a company where the hills are allied with the sound of science <laughs> is just a great way to do it. Uh, well done. But, uh, all right. Now, uh, by contrast, we have, uh, Darren, you represent the, the individual who has the very established company in California, and yet you're facing, you're facing all sorts of issues uh, in terms of going back and talking to your investors about why being in California. Absolutely. No, as a, as a public company uh, trying to maximize profitability in the difficult times we have, I get questions frequently from investors and individual investors saying, why California? Why don't you move to a lower cost location, whether that's Texas, Alabama, South Carolina, or Asia, overseas? Uh, and the answer is, frankly, we build a very high-tech product. It's not casual labor that puts it together. And we're all about efficiency, about being lean, and about how many people it takes to build the product and build it right the first time. Uh, California, with all the aerospace background, is a perfect fit for us. There's a lot of aerospace uh, individuals out there that have the technology and have the background that we need to build our product, and we use a lot of ex-military as well. But it's a challenge. Uh, we really have to make sure that every employee we have, we get maximum value out of maximum efficiency. Uh, we spend a lot of money training them, work very hard on employee retention, uh, because employee turnover, as expensive as employees can be in California, is, is a killer to us. And that's something we'll come back and address even further. But sure. it's, uh, and it's one of the things that we you know, have to look at, and it, I think that it makes a good transition, though, focusing on the importance of the quality of talent, is that one of, the, one of the big issues that we're facing in California is that even though the state produces an incredible number of talented individuals, there is often a mismatch between the talented individuals and the employment, and further, we're handicapped by the fact that right now only 56% of our college students are actually graduating, and a third of college students need remedial education. How do we address the skills shortfall, Kim? You're the expert in this regard. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a big it's a big problem, and obviously there's not a simple answer to this. But 
Um, I think there are some things that we can do that, that will have high impact that are immediate. Um, one is, you mentioned that something like 55% of students don't graduate within six years uh, in, in undergrad in, in, um, in our universities. Part of the reason is tuition is so high, students are dropping out to get jobs. Part of the reason is a very inefficient way that we actually have students move through the system. For example, uh, many students transfer between a community college and Cal State or UC. Mm -hmm. When they do, they often have to repeat courses they've already taken because each university, each institution believes that its own s courses, even lower division standard courses, are unique. And therefore, the student has to take you know, Econ 101 over again or whatever it is. And that's crazy. We now have an opportunity to, to actually leverage online digital education, the MOOCs, as they're called, multi uh, open online courses and deliver these st lower division courses and make them available and enable a system where we could actually have universal transfer of credits between these different campuses. Kind of like Visa created a financial system that enabled us to basically do have, you know, swipe our credit card anywhere in the world at any store. Well, we should be able to take that same idea and make it work in our educational system. So I'm just taking one, one very small thing that we could do that would actually have a tremendous impact. So again, the idea here would be standardize, create a universal standardized set of lower division courses, the top 25 to 40, offer them through MOOCs, enable high school students to take these courses before they even arrive on campus so they could, you know, study courses before they get there and avoid the remedial, you know, coursework, which is a huge multi-billion cost multi-billion dollar annual cost in our public universities. And then, again, avoid this problem of students repeating courses. On average, uh, students end up completing an extra year of course credits by the time they graduate because they have to repeat courses. That's crazy. So there are some high impact things we can do, again, leveraging technology immediately to, to address some of these problems. I have to say, once upon a time, I was actually a professor at Santa Monica College. And I would say that as a, from a personal standpoint, I would, would be uh, mortally offended the idea that somehow my class wasn't good enough when, when people were transferring out. I, I also say the, the interesting inverse is that the favorite classes I actually taught were the night classes because they had the people who were actually there and had made the choice to uh, go back and choose specifically what they wanted in school. And, right. it, and that is an issue for us is that we often we don't provide direction for people and they find out they drop out. Now, the good news is a number of people go back and continue their educations later, but it is an issue. Now, the gentleman to the left of me, who, whose name will remain hidden, I, I say, let me figure after I gave you the nice intro earlier, we'll just, yeah. you know, bring it on. Up, well. All right, fine. I, one of the things that, that actually uh, that came up is, is the issue of risk, and you put yourself out there early on in terms of starting a number of different companies. What made it possible for you to actually be involved in, in starting companies and what keeps you interested in that and what do you say to somebody who would want to start a company here in California? Well, a couple of things. I'm in politics so I'll do everything to avoid answering the question directly. That's fine. Um, I'll drink number it Number two, anyway. I just want to convert. So this is a positive panel, right? They're mostly positive. All right. we, we start with a negative and then we fix it. All right, well good. Just a couple, <laughs> couple of thoughts just because I feel fiduciary responsibility as Lieutenant Governor of California make a case for this state on the positive side of the ledger. You know, two years ago we faced a $27 billion budget deficit. We're right now projecting anywhere from 4 to $5 billion surplus this year. We still have a wall of debt north of $30 billion, but we actually have a strategy to pay it down substantially uh, between now and 2017, three, $4 billion a year. We deal with the great challenge that everyone understands intimately here, particularly in Milken, and that's the unfunded liability, particularly CalSTRS and CalPERS, the unrealistic actuarials in terms of returns, and the challenges that amount to anywhere minimum of $181 million billion to as high as half a trillion dollars, depending on which study you want to read and how bad and gloomy your actuarial uh, uh, sense is. Uh, that's our great challenge. That said, we also are struggling uh, with a state where we're living in two different worlds. Uh, coastal economy and an inland mm -hmm. economy. Unemployment at 9.4 percent, which is substantially down from this time last year at 10.7, but remarkable at 9.4 percent. 1.7 million people actively seeking work. It can't find it. I left this morning from Marin County, 5.2 percent unemployment. 
the lowest in the state. We're a stone's throw away from Imperial County, north of 23 percent. And if you're in Calusa County, they're at 23.9% today. So when I say living in two different worlds in the same state, I think those numbers sort of ex exemplify that. In order to get to balance, we've had to make some difficult cuts. Uh, Kim talks about the work that needs to be done on remedial education, address the issue of tuition, as she noted, as a barrier uh, to graduation within six years, uh, particularly at our CSU. Uh, the challenge is we put a lot of sand in the gears, that conveyor belt for talent. In the last two years, we've increased, or rather, we have cut the budget by close to $2 billion. Uh, we have doubled tuition since 2007, more than tripled at 383% since 2001 at the UC system, just to put that in perspective. So we, we've made a lot of difficult choices, but at least we have had a successful debate around solvency. What we haven't had is a debate about greatness. To wit, my point is this a positive discussion. Uh, and that's the debate we need to re-engage in again in California, because at our best, we're always a state of dreamers, of doers, of entrepreneurs, of innovators, on the leading and cutting edge of new ideas. A coast of dreams, as Reagan so evocatively spoke about this great state, as pioneering spirit, Horace Greeley, go west, young man, go west in the 1850s. We've lost that sense of spirit. We've lost that sense of pride. The substantive part of my point is the issue of solvency seems for the moment with a collision course on debt and entitlement in three, four years to at least been resolved and the dust is settling and we're not having the same acuity of debate that we've had in the last decade or so around a financial crisis and cash flow problems. So now we can enter into a real discussion about what were our engines of growth? What made us the tent pole of the American economy in terms of job creation? Why is it that folks on this panel, decided to invest in California for that matter uh, as a small business person with a small wine store with one. I just is finishing my third sequa uh, challenge in Napa uh, with a new winery. Uh, opened my 17th business in the state and I have about a thousand people that I employ. Why is it? And it's because of that spirit and that mm -hmm. sense of, uh, you know, that quality of imagination that still defines the best of the state and that is alive and well in pockets in the state and simply needs to be scaled and uh, look forward to talking about how we can do that. Yes, and, they, and one thing that it very much brings up is that as a state that everybody knows here in this room is high cost and is often very difficult to navigate the regulatory side, one of the most important things for California, particularly on the innovative side, is to focus on why do you get value for the money? Because if there is not that value, if you don't recognize that value, if you don't feel like you're getting that kind of value, particularly through innovation, then there's a very good question of why you're going to be in the state. And bringing that up, since Joe, we definitely need to hear from you. And you've got a good story to tell, since you were, uh, you were not only a passionate individual, you were an individual who went through and established your company. Given the circumstances the way they are now, and given the way that you grew Massimo over the years, and you, wait, you, were, a, you were a garage startup, correct? Yes. So uh, given that, could you pull it off now? Uh, would you be able to start the company? Would you be able to grow it now uh, in, under the circumstances the way you did when you first started? Well, first of all, given that I'm last, I can't wait to talk, so I'm going well, to talk, talk a lot. <laughs> but um, California is probably still the best place to start a company. But uh, given the things that have happened since 24 years ago when I started my company in my garage, I would say probably not. And, uh, you know, what's, what's great about California, it's the ecosystem, you know, from having great lawyers to having, believe it or not, to having, um, uh, you know, the venture capital community, to having the angel investors, to great schools and universities. But, you know, we have a vision in front of us of companies that have kept making it, making it. And we have a pool of people who've made a lot of money from making it. And those people uh, are what really should be commended for starting a company like Massimo. Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones, without them kind of be believing in the crazy idea of what I was going to do, we wouldn't get there. But the one thing I remember they relied on heavily when they made those investments uh, is that we had this great idea, this technology that was going to revolutionize non-invasive monitoring. But, you know, I was 23, 24. I didn't have any experience. I didn't have distribution set. I didn't have anything, right? But what I had was a novel idea with strong patent protection. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the patent laws were very favorable to inventors. And uh, 
I remember the VCs would do a lot of due diligence on the patents. Do they think, is it novel? Can it withstand challenge? And because damages were great, and because you could get an injunction automatically if you found someone to infringe, they made the bet. What's happened since I started Massimo is unfortunately both from passages of law as well as the Federal Circuit creating case law uh, and Supreme Court creating case law. Injunctions are no longer automatic with patents. Uh, you don't have uh, the damages are now focused on apportionment and what did your invention really mean? Mm -hmm. And did you get to charge a premium for it, which I'm getting a little too technical. But these, these things make it difficult for someone to want to place a bet on a 23-year-old with an idea that maybe the bigger companies can just readily take. Plus, the FDA takes longer, and I'm in the medical technology side. Regulatory landscape has changed dramatically. What used to take three to four months can take two to three years now. You've got on top of the medical device tax, you've got, you've got a lot of things that are unfortunately taking venture capitalists out of the equation. I've read that VC and startup companies in the medical technology sector is down by over 70% over the last three years. You know, great institution like Alta Partners that did nothing but invest in med tech are getting out of it. And that's why I don't know if Massimo 24 years ago could be where it is today if it started today. And I hate to get in the middle, but Massimo, is Actually, that, we want you in the middle of But that. Is, that, is that a California, I mean, a lot of those things go to the macro, go to this country. The FDA issues, the larger venture capital issues. I mean, how do you compare then the state of your industry vis-a-vis -vis where it was when you're 23 years old versus where it is today in this state in particular? Well, as I stated at the beginning, I actually still think California is the easiest place to get started relative to not only the U.S. but the world. Uh, so, no, it is a problem for the whole country. country. Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, California it makes it a little tougher for employers. You know, we, we believe in having the best and the brightest. There's books about it, you know, load your bus with the best people, right? But then if you try to get rid of somebody, you know, lawsuits go crazy. And uh, right. so there are issues in California that adds pressure. There's the taxes that adds pressure. But for a startup company, mostly you don't really face those things until you're more mature. And then you think about, do I have to leave to New Mexico or wherever? Yeah, I think that's a bigger issue is companies will start here and innovate here, yeah. but will they stay here long term? Will they build that second plant here, that third plant here? And there's the pressure to go to lower cost markets or to just get out of California. So I think innovating is wonderful, but we need manufacturing jobs. We need more people uh, working, not just innovating. And it's, it's one thing that we often forget is that California is still the biggest single manufacturing state in the country. The distinction is, is that we're no longer the manufacturing state for the huge plants. Everybody is aware of the fact that we don't make airplanes the way we used to in the state, that we don't make cars the way we used to in the state, unless, of course, you want to buy a Tesla. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, the, but the fact is that we are a great small manufacturing state, small to mid-sized manufacturing and specialized manufacturing. And the real issue is, as Darren said, is that you know, with Capstone, if you reach a point where your demand keeps going higher, you're already under a lot of pressure to move some elements of your operations to where your overseas partners are, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I get, I get emails and calls every week from other states saying, you know, come do business in Texas, come do business in, yeah. in North Carolina. They're out there actively trying to solicit California businesses saying, we'll give you the tax credits, we'll help set you up with employees, we'll, we'll do everything we can to help you get the, the start that you and, need. And just and out of curiosity, have you ever gotten business? a call from anyone from the state? No. Yeah. And I, I'm with you. This is, I mean, this, this is code red. It's inexcusable. We don't have an economic development plan. We don't have an industrial policy. We don't have an export plan. We don't have a trade and commerce office. We shut it down in 2003 when Tom Freeman was writing his book, The World is Flat. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. We've rested on our laurels. We're like an old aging high school quarterback talking about the good old days. And, and the fact is we need to wake up to this reality. And it's not just Rick Perry case in our joint coming on hunting trips. 24-7 in this state, but go down to Laguna Beach. I mean, they have, Virginia County has a 24-hour commerce agency in Laguna Beach. They have one in Silicon Valley. Austin Chamber of Commerce has opened their third office in California. Utah opened it years and years ago. And these guys are Hickenloopers into down today. Uh, at least John called me, good guy, uh, saying I'm coming here trying to get jobs. And we have no kind of intentionality as it relates to our efforts in other states, let alone overseas. So, you know, we're a $1.9 trillion economy, that's good. Ninth largest, we were eight, Brazil took over, but you can't begrudge success on the other side of the aisle.
But we've got to step up and step in, and we've got to own up to the fact that it's no longer good enough to take advantage of the cyclical re rebound. Because if I'm the governor, I'm saying, hey, everything's great. We've got 286,000 jobs we've created in the last 12 months. No other states uh, uh, created as many jobs. 25.5 thousand uh, in the last month alone. United States, only 88,000. California's back. But, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And it's not because of our work. Again, we've done a good job in the budget. That's important. As a business person, that's critical because that creates mass uncertainty. But at the end of the day, we've got to own up to the fact that you matter and we care. And we've got to demonstrate that in, I think, a more proactive way. Yeah, and you, you did a trip to Texas a while back to see what they were up to. Paid a huge price. You know, it's because we're tribal. It's Democrats versus Republicans. So I had the audacity to join six Democrats on a bipartisan trip to go out because I was sick of hearing about Perry too. So I want to learn about this Texas One model. Problem was, every single Democrat was threatened not to go, so every single one of them dropped out. I went stupidly, foolishly, and had an op-ed in the paper, my labor friends condemning the trip. The governor was furious uh, when making the calls, uh, encouraging us not to highlight Rick Perry. Uh, and the argument was, well, you're obviously not for clean water. <laughs> you're not interested in the eight-hour work day. I mean, these were literally, I read the op-eds around this. And so it's this defensive posture, and as you all know, as successful people, and you certainly on the panel, if you're not casing other people's joints, they're casing yours. I mean, we've got to be in the business of looking for best practices wherever we can find them, not just because of red state or blue state. And we have Democratic plans for economic development and Republican plans. It's comedy. If I were mayor, when I was mayor of San Francisco, if I came out with a Democratic plan to clean up the graffiti, I'd have been <laughs> laughed out of the city. They don't care. They just want to get the job done. But you get at the state level, the federal level, it's, again, that tribal frame. And, and we've got to wake up to this reality. And, and again, California's coming back. And we can lay claim, you know, pat ourselves on the back, what a great job we're doing. But again, it's not because there is a strategic effort, focused movement for job creation and supporting these mid-sized businesses that truly become the engine of our economic recovery as they scale and grow within the state organically. Let, let me also add to that, I, I couldn't agree more, we're at the same time that we're not being proactive and strategic, we're introducing legislation or, uh, you know, we're seeing in legislation introduced that will potentially dampen more startup activity and encourage states to move out. And let me just mention two areas. One is there's a whole new slew of privacy bills. Now, we're the intention, but we've got a, a very nascent industry of you know, startup companies that are in all sorts of different areas, whether it's energy efficiency, devices in your home to monitor energy, or social media startups, you name it. Privacy starts to be, you know, an issue in a lot of mm -hmm. these different companies. If you start dampening innovation by introducing provisions that startups now have to check a million boxes and, you know, agree to things that no startup can agree to, just getting out of the gate, that's crazy. So California has, I think, over a dozen privacy bills now that have been introduced or proposed. So we, you know, that's one area. Another area, there's a suggestion that we eliminate the R&D tax credit. I mean, how, how dumb would that be? Yeah. But it's actually being seriously discussed and debated. And where our R&D tax credit is already worse than anybody else's almost. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it, and that is a big issue is that we're looking, one of the things we have to keep on looking into is that when we're looking for revenue, we, we, we established a, a, a budget stability element that was very essential, but people then look at it and say, okay, all right, I'm paying more. What am I getting back for that? And one of the big areas that people immediately were looking at is education. And education is absolutely essential to the state. It is a, it is a, a vital element. One of the things we did at the Institute in California Center is a, well, a couple years ago, we did a piece called uh, What Brain Drain. We found that California actually bleeds out talent, native-born talent, more slowly than any other state. We do a better job at retaining because the demand is there, the recognition of the skills is there. The, the, the real problem that we found is that people aren't moving. Young, talented people aren't moving into California the way they were anymore, because they can, partly because they can't afford it, partly because companies don't necessarily recruit them is readily here. There are a number of different factors, but the end result is that the net internal migration for California within the United States has been negative over the last two decades. We're this great immigrant center, but at the same time, we have the whole issue, and you'll keep on seeing it in the news about the H-1B visas uh, and the fact that the state that was most affected by the dramatic cutback in those visas 
was California. And the real reason for that is because these were people coming in with ideas who went to our schools, particularly our universities, and wanted to stay here with their ideas. And if we don't want them, uh, they will go somewhere else because they'll have the connections elsewhere. And one of the places actually that uh, I, I find fascinating in, in the idea of best practices for retaining talent is that is Canada. And, we talk, and Peter, we talked a little bit earlier yep, about Vancouver, yeah. and they, they've done this incredible job of essentially going after what we've let get away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we got like a little bit more on the negative track in Fashion California. Yeah, but um, I feel that, for example... We're going to fix that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Coming back. Um, I, I feel, for example, that I have the same problem as mentioned before and in terms of other states and other countries reaching yeah. out to me, can we move you out of California? But I also had the city knock on my door and say, can we talk with you and give you tax credits? Right? So there is it's both of that, I think, happening mm -hmm. a little bit. Right? Um, and with regards to, to the education problem, which I agree is, is a huge issue, and it's definitely something we need to fix. But I also agree with what, what you said, um, uh, that it is not necessarily a California-specific problem. It's a problem that we have as a country. And if you look at where the innovation is coming from, I still think that we as a country can look to California because Udacity was started here. There was a, a, a tenured professor at one of the most prestigious universities in the That's world, right. and, uh, and he just left, right? I mean, just said, I'm going to do this differently. And I was lucky enough, I was one of the uh, participants in their first class, the now famous um, Stanford AI class from Sebastian Thruman and Peter Norvig. Um, and they had 160,000 students across the world participate in. 200 in the classroom, 160,000 online. Yes. Because one of the things that, that, uh, that uh, Peter realized is that about halfway through the class, um, his students that were registered in Stanford left because they said it's so much better to do it online. So I think we do see innovation that the country is producing. We still have some of the best ideas here. Um, and it's like the sproutling is still happening in California. And I think we maybe can now move on to how do we water it? How do we provide it with the nourishment so that other countries and other states can learn from it. Yeah. But and, and, and I mean, look, and back to that ledger. I mean, we have more scientists, more engineers, more researchers, more Nobel laureates, more patents emanating out of this state, more venture capital than any other state in the nation. Still have Caltech, Stanford, UC uh, system, includes the, the, the greats like Berkeley and UCLA and others, all among the top universities on the planet, all here in California one of the most diverse workforces. We're on birthplace of life science and biotech and leading the way in genomics and nanotechnology and synthetic biology and artificial intelligence, as you know, and robotics and sensor Space. technology, <coughs> uh, 3D ad manufacturing, added manufacturing. Space uh, so exploration. It's in, in space yeah, exploration yeah. by definition. So it is an extraordinary state. But you've got to own up, you know, we've got to, you, we've got to look at cost of energy, we've got to look at the challenges associated with doing manufacturing in this state, uh, the issues as it relates to our competitors, and we've got to own up to those realities, and that's what's missing. <clears throat> we kind of rest on all those attributes, but we're not reconciling those liabilities in an honest and, I think, reflective way. And I think we could steal the stuff from Canada, for example, right? So if we were looking at Vancouver as a location as well, and I would have gotten 40 cents for every dollar that I spent on R&D, which includes my electricity bill, my rent, my, my staff costs. So I can hire a PhD who does research on a computer, and I get 40% of his salary back. And investors, in, angel investors in Canada, they get 30% of every dollar that they invest in a startup um, that raises less than a million dollars at the end of the year back. So they get, within 12 months, a 30% return on their investment. Right? So those are relatively, I would say, simple things that can be implemented. They created a huge draw for me to be in Vancouver. In the end, the universities and the access to capital um, won out for me in the short term. But in the long term, I mean, I get calls from Hong Kong where they basically say, we pay 50% of your research cost. And the you know, best computer scientists there are about a third of the costs. Right? So scaling, there are models in, in places like Hong Kong or Singapore or Canada some of which I would think are relatively easily implementable here that would allow you know, my companies, your companies, the companies here on this panel to stay and grow in California yeah. rather than leave. Can we just stick up slide number nine for one second? And just as a visual. I just, it's worth noting is that we're, it's a situation where California has such an absurd number of the top 200 universities. If you think about that, we've got 12 of the top 200 universities 
uh, in, in the world according to the uh, Times of London World University rankings, including number one in Caltech and number two in Stanford. And the fact is that there is an international recognition, this isn't just us playing it up, of the capacity of our educational system, our university system, as much as people talk about underfunding in our, in our educational system and the fact in the direct impact of the tuition increases, the fact is that we have this tremendous capacity not only for skilled people to come out of these universities, but also for technology transfer. And that makes a tremendous difference. Now, I mean, Joe, do you ever find that where it, that uh, the, the local universities, both in recruiting talent and in terms of like the medical device industry, does it make a difference having that kind of resource? Absolutely. Uh, but you know, there is no monopoly on great people and great ideas in True. California. I think what we really have going in California is one, the God-given sun and beauty that really keeps <laughs> us here. I mean, a lot of us, which really fights hard against all the taxes and all the stuff that gets done to us, and at some point it may push some of us out of here. But I think the second is the sophistication of the investors. Uh, anyone from Oklahoma here? When I first started Massimo, I mean, in my living room came the Lieutenant Governor of Oklahoma. And I, up until then, I probably had $100,000 invested in Massimo. They offered me six, seven million, six to $7 million to move Massimo to Oklahoma because they wanted the ecosystem to begin there. But you know, what I found is that they don't have the sophistication there. You know, we just did something in Kentucky University because a lot of bright people are there. With a f friend of mine who's from Kentucky, we said, let's try to create a foundry there and let's try to start ideas and companies out of Kentucky and maybe repeat that model at other universities that are not as famous as Berkeley or Stanford. And as things were getting going and getting good, the investors that had invested there kind of didn't know how to handle that. Or when things were bad and we had to put more money or there were failures, they didn't know how to handle that. This is a sophisticated group here that knows fail fast, knows when to put more money in, when not to, when not, when not to get greedy. So I think really that's what we have to preserve. We have to preserve that group and not do things to run them out of here. Mm -hmm. Now, Darren, you, you uh, in particular have been uh, especially aggressively recruited by Texas, which admittedly is no Oklahoma, but still it's <laughs> a... Uh, this is beautiful. Yes. Uh, well, there are parts of Oklahoma that are absolutely wonderful, uh, but uh, I can't say necessarily that's where I would imagine having a medical research company, but anything's possible. But what is, I, you know, Texas obviously has the cost savings and they certainly have some incentives, but what do they lack? Uh, what do you find that when you're, when you're dealing with them? What were they missing? I, I think for us it's more of the, it's the R&D side of it. It's the, the PhDs and the engineers that we need. I think the, the lower level talent and, and the, the uh, blue collar talent's easier to find in Texas. I think the cost of living is obviously much lower. Uh, it's big in energy, which obviously mm -hmm. attracts us. Uh, you've got a lot of oil and gas there, which is a big part of our business as well. Uh, but I think for us, we need to be able to get high level engineers uh, that come in and can hit the ground running. And again, it need to be very productive. I think you said earlier, what's the value for the dollar we spend? Uh, so if we're going to spend $20,000 a year more on an engineer here than we would in Texas, we need to make sure that's an A player and we're getting high level output out of those folks. And that's really what we're about is, again, I mentioned you lean on the manufacturing side, but high productivity on the engineering side, the program management side. Uh, so we get a lot out of, you know, 225 employees which maybe we could afford 400 somewhere else, but if they're less efficient, you're really not gaining a whole bunch. Yeah, and, that, and that's a, a, one of the big arguments, not just for, a, for California versus Texas, but that's a big, it's a big deal when we're dealing with competition overseas as well, correct, is that it's, how produ it's not just a matter of the innovation, but it's also the productivity. Now, I mean, Peter, you've been looking at some places o you've yeah. dealt with overseas. Yeah, yeah. and it's um, in, in places like, uh, like France, for example, what the, in the end deterred us from Strasbourg was the speed of getting things done there is just like, you know, it's like glacial, right? I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, and then you actually can find very talented people, but basically once they're in the door, they will not leave and it's impossible for you to get rid of them. And so if your business needs to change, um, you just simply can't. Um, it's a little bit trickier with a place like Hong Kong. Right, so Hong Kong has, has great incentives. They basically would pay 50% of my whole cost if I, if I move an R&D center there. Um, the, the cost for very, very high quality computer science talent is literally a third. Um, so the biggest question there is, uh, is language actually. Right, so the, the level of English, it's in Hong Kong a little bit better than if you go to let's say Shanghai or Shenzhen. 
Um, but Hong Kong is, you know, I, ha I have to be honest, it's, um, it's very tempting. And then you got Singapore in the mix, right, mm -hmm. where access to capital um, is very readily available. You have a hyper-efficient government that is really just the, I mean, I worked there as a consultant, and, and what is like mind-blowing is that the people that I worked with were in the government, and they were absolutely the brightest top 0.1% of the country. Right? They paid him a million bucks. I don't know yeah, if, you, if you got a million bucks, yeah, right? It's close. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they managed to have like really the brightest people that run yeah. in the country. And they just make very, very smart decisions. And they make big bets, right? They just um, uh, two months ago decided that they want to invest into the space industry. And there's literally, we're talking millions of dollars of, of bringing people there, basically getting rid of all the red tape and says, we can get you up and running in one week. And so that definitely is a, it's, it's a, there are definitely lures out there um, that make it hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, uh, I mean, I've spent a bit of time in the Central Valley, which speaking of areas that, uh, that we talked about earlier with the high unemployment rate, and you're talking about an area that would love to do something like that. They would love, you know, there are a number of people there who would love to be, you know, be essentially California's Texas, so to speak, as certain people have phrased it, uh, that they would uh, like to, uh, uh, they would like to attract a lot of people, but uh, they it's very they find it very hard to just navigate through that red tape. What could what could they do? What what's been doing? What's been going on there that you actually see, Gavin? Their uh, positive signs. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, look, if you don't like the way the world looks when you're standing up, stand on your head and go local. To your point, a lot of good things are happening at the local level. You have 476 cities in the state of California, about 58 counties, and there's some outstanding leaders in regional economic development. So any economic development framework to address your question and the broader concerns mm -hmm. about California's competitiveness has to be framed from regions rising together. You've got to flip the pyramid. It can't be Sacramento sort of preaching on down an economic development strategy, particularly in a state as diverse as our state, where you have you know, anywhere, depending on how you want to define, seven to 14 vibrant economic regions, each with their unique attributes and needs as it relates to a workforce development strategy to twin them. So. Look, the plug and play zone examples in Singapore have been well evidenced around the rest of the world. It is perfect, and I love the segue to the point for us to advance efforts and support regional economic development, programmatic ERs, deal with the pre development risks, uh, do as of right zoning, come up with some creative strategies and holidays as it relates to the burdens of higher taxation, energy costs, and related issues, uh, and begin to set up some pilots in certain counties and cities. Now, we came out, I say we, my office, went out out of frustration because I don't I mean I get it I'm part of the problem uh, but a little frustration as lieutenant governor I was shocked that there wasn't an economic development plan I thought you know, I, I campaigned saying there wasn't but assumed there was somebody somewhere that had something <laughs> that I was gonna somewhere. go okay I learned I was wrong I was a little it was I was just a exuberant campaigner uh, now I'm gonna be a more mature uh, lieutenant governor it turned out I was wrong I was just not even close Things were much worse from that perspective. We've and never really had one. Never really had one. And, and there are outside groups like yours that are constantly putting out papers that we then say, oh, yeah, we have one, Milkins. Uh, <laughs> and so what I did is I, I took a lot of yours. You guys are incredibly helpful. Went out, hired McKinsey, raised money privately. And we cased other people's joints across the country, learned about uh, you know, the Ohio Third Frontier Program and dealing with the Valley of Debt as it relates to financing, uh, dealing with Pennsylvania's strategy as it relates to some of their exports plans or overseas offices that have been strategically aligned with Maryland and Florida. We went to Singapore and learned about these plug and play zones, South Korea, about some of their interesting digital strategies, et cetera, and put it out there and laid out in specific detail, specific pilots starting small to start building some momentum. Unfortunately, and again, I, I'm going to support him, and I think he's doing an exceptionally good job, Governor Brown. This is not an indictment, but I'm here to call balls and strikes because I'm frustrated. But the governor's office is not, is not their priority. There are good people there. We've got an economic development group of really talented folks, but they haven't been unleashed. And they don't have that direction. It's not a passion. Whatever Jerry Brown focuses on, he's exceptionally gifted at accomplishing. And as I said, the issue of solvency has vexed the last two or three administrations. And we've been able to tackle that to no small degree because of his leadership. I want to see that same energy in the next two years, six years, from the governor's office on the issue of bringing California back to prominence so that we're not playing defense all the time. And to start making the case that we can connect these dots east to west, it's no longer north-south divide. And we have to be aggressive in these type of partnerships 
with industry and particularly in the manufacturing side because you're about to hit the collision course on energy costs yep. with I'm very proud of AB32 but just get ready in the next year and a half people have a feeling it's already been implemented we're just getting started and all of a sudden we're going to be hitting uh, this thing uh, at a speed that is you know, now with Prop 30 passing and everything else a lot of discussion about a split role on the manufacturing side as it relates to issues of industrial taxes and commercial taxes uh, there's going to be real concern uh, that I think could substantially impact our recovery. Yeah, one of the things also that just it, it indirectly brings up in my mind is the fact that uh, one of the key issues in, in innovation uh, and getting back to it is the fact that we help to pay for innovation through exports, we pay we, we through our involvement in international economies. And one of the real issues for California is that we have been underperforming in export growth relative to the, re the country as a whole, and we've been underperforming uh, in particular, obviously, in comparison to Texas, but also into states like Pennsylvania, like Florida. Florida, uh, Florida actually has a, a number of issues, but they uh, are absolutely brilliant in terms of coming up with connections for international exports. Absolutely. And now, just going back and talking with it, uh, Darren, you, you also, when you deal with a high-value product that you, yep. uh, that you export around the world, it in addition to just dealing with the, the, the basic issues, you also have to deal with the fact that there's a huge amount of pressure for uh, you to shift the high value, a lot of the high value parts overseas, correct? Not Absolutely. just from a cost, but otherwise. Absolutely. Yes. No, and I think we do a lot on the supply chain side. Even though we're a California manufacturer, we're buying globally. Uh, we're sourcing globally, and I think every, every company has to do that. Now, where we can, we try to buy as locally as we can. We try to look at it from a three-dimensional standpoint, not just first cost, what's the shipping cost, what's the quality issues, uh, you know, can they give us extended terms. There's a lot of, a lot of different things you can do to, to lower cost as we see it. Uh, but it absolutely, as a public company, we have to drive margins as high as we can and costs as low as we can. Right. Uh, so you, as much as you want to buy U.S. or you want to buy California, you have to do the right thing for the business. Right. But it's definitely a challenge. And I think uh, we won an e-commerce award a couple of years ago. We're a heavy exporter. Um, we're a California heavy exporter manufacturing company. I feel a little bit like the, the dodo bird. We're kind of a dying uh, <laughs> animal out there. Uh, but the reality is it, it can be done, and I think we, we conti will continue to do it. But uh, energy costs are definitely an issue. Uh, we can help uh, companies lower energy costs. That's something that needs to be talked about more. Um, you know, there's only three microturbine manufacturers in the world. Two of them are in California. Mm -hmm. uh, California, until a couple of years ago, was one of our smallest markets, which mm -hmm. was uh, very ironic. Mm -hmm. so, Indeed. Yeah. And Joe, how do you feel? I mean, how do you feel about that? Is that uh, you, know, you you sell around the world? What kind of issues do you run into in that regard as well? Um, well, the medical technology space, healthcare in general, we're one of the biggest exporters of all the industries. Mm -hmm. So we do really well. Uh, in fact, we started our sales in Europe and Japan before we began in the U.S. because of a little bit because of the FDA, but also because of group purchasing organizations that were in between vendors and hospitals that started getting paid by vendors. It's a long story, but so but our industry is actually uh, a good, a very good exporter. And uh, but as you indicated, when we go out to make our printed circuit boards, our technologies. Even though we're working with local companies, their factories are in Malaysia or their factories are in uh, China. So, and they'll start manufacturing here, but then to really get the costs out, they've got to move it offshore for production there, and then they ship it back to us and we assemble it here. Got it. Uh, Peter, would you run into that in terms of the, the, the uh, keeping the value here? I mean, for you, I mean, do you have to, you do a lot of, inter you work with international partners, correct? Yeah, yeah. So how does that work out for you in that regard? Um, well, I, I deal in an industry which is, which is highly regulated, so I have to navigate not only the cost but also the regulatory side. Um, and even though there is um, regulation into, in getting into Congress, which is going to make my education satellites much easier, I'm literally producing my satellites actually in Europe. I'm producing one of the core parts in the country and ship the core parts to Europe and have it manufactured there. Um, and that is not a California-specific issue, right? It is a, it's a countrywide issue. Um, but as I said beforehand, um, the, the scaling issue for, for getting uh, computer science talents and the support you get from other countries is just very, very tempting for us. In terms of prototyping and, like, starting something, there is, uh, California was by far the best place. I mean, you had you get crowdfunding here, you got tech shops. I mean, like, one of my engineers spends probably half his days at tech shop because they have one and a half million dollars of equipment and we pay $199 a month 
for his membership. Yeah. And he was started here in California. Yeah. And I think it is, you know, that feeds into the maker movement and, and 3D printing, all of which is happening here. I think the, the trick is how do we have those sproutlings, the innovation which actually starts here, and how do you have people like me or like, um, uh, like Darren not leave because others are saying that, oh, now I see that you know how to do it. Come over here, I give you money, and you got cheaper access to capital, lower taxes. Yeah, what well, would be great if we could somehow create subsidies for hiring labor? You know, yeah. the same way we have ca farming subsidies, because I know it's a little, uh, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, uh, some people may disagree with it, but, you know, labor rate in, the, in California, in the U.S. general, is about $15 an hour. You go to Mexico, and it's about $3 an hour. You go to China, it's a dollar an hour. And, you know, if Apple doesn't make the stuff in China, uh, well, Samsung will, right? So you can't really say, I'm going to make things here no matter what, because I want to make things here. You'll lose <laughs> you'll lose selling anything. So if there was a way we could get subsidies for bringing labor here, then even if it was matching what we do in Mexico, then I think a lot of people would love to uh, bring more manufacturing jobs. And you there. can do this for high quality labor as well. Like in France, they say they pay 100% of a PhD for the first year, and then every single year 20% less. So I can hire a high quality R&D person, and in the first year it doesn't cost me a single dime. And in the next year it only costs me 20% of what the individual makes. So that um, subsidy or supporting of having uh, talent doesn't necessarily only have to be on the low end of the scale. It can go all the way to the high end, which then further you know, keeps R&D and the actual development here. Mm -hmm. Now, Kim, from an investor, from investor side standpoint, how do you view that kind of pressure? And say, if you're, looking, if you're looking at a company, what are you looking for in a California company that makes the, an innovative California company that makes them viable and, and what kind of advice would you give them? Well, um, it's, it's true that this really is, is the mecca, California, Silicon Valley in particular, and it's become even more so for the entrepreneurs of the world. Mm -hmm. And what I've been seeing actually is the smartest, the best and brightest from every country, every major city and all over the world are coming here now. They're actually starting mm -hmm. companies, often keeping their R&D teams back home, you know, locating the management team here, getting funding from you know, venture capital. Uh, in California and we're seeing some some pretty phenomenal entrepreneurs from not just from California but from the rest of the world adopting that model very successfully and it keeps their keeps their cost of, of labor low because it's actually cheaper often to keep you know an R&D team back in say Denmark or Poland than it is here um, they're able to you know get top talent on the management side here and raise you know top tier venture capital so that model I've been seeing very successfully implemented I'm actually impressed with a lot of the talent that I see coming here from offshore. So I, uh, not only are we you know, growing our own here, um, we need to do more of that, but we're also attracting some of the best from all over the world. Now the question again is, will they scale, will they, will they build out the companies here, or will that talent ultimately migrate offshore? That's why I mean, I appreciate guys like Perry, he's great at PR, but at the end of the day, the real or growth is organic growth, and it's a retention strategy, not just a recruitment strategy. And we're not, again, it's something we keep emphasizing, the state needs to focus on supporting its own organic growth, because we all lay claim to some fundamental facts that we don't have a startup problem per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so the challenge is just scaling uh, and supporting that organic growth. Look, a couple things. Cal what, what, we just have to lean in again to the world we're living in. I mean, we need to wake up every day and ask ourselves, what, what are the trend lines that define the world we're living in? And how does California take advantage of them? Uniquely California to take advantage of them. Uh, the issues of you know, H-1B, we talk about it. You know, it's frustrating, I imagine, to a lot of you. Where is California's leadership dominantly? Are we front and center in that debate on immigration reform? In, in every respect, we have more at stake than any other state, not just as it relates to the Valley and the issues associated with H-1Bs, but the obvious issue of uh, workers in the Central Valley, and, you know, and the issues of the agricultural community. We need to start asserting ourselves on the national and global stage again on so many of these uh, fronts. It's not, though, a race to the bottom. We have to be careful. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we're never going to be the cheapest place to do business, but we can be the best place to do business. And it's reinvigorating those engines of growth. We had a formula for success. You all know it. Started with education. And we were living off those past investments, certainly as it relates to higher ed. And I would argue, and this is why Kim's been so fabulous and we've shared a lot on the issue of higher education, it's not a sustainable model, our higher education model. 
And I do think we need to own up to that. And we need to dramatically recommit ourselves to reinventing it. The K through 12 cannot be reformed. I'm not interested in failing more efficiently. It has to be completely redesigned and reimagined. And the idea that we're still educating people with rows of desks based on their data manufacture is honestly comical. Uh, and we have to, I think, lead the nation in dramatically redesigning an educational strategy, K through 12. But we've always been, and this is where the federal advocacy is critical, not just on immigration, and I, I'll, I'll close, but on issues like R&D. I mean, I think, I, I drive up to Sacramento from Marin. I drive by, by Sandia Labs, Lawrence Livermore Labs, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, NASA Ames, uh, UCSF, UC Davis, all within 100 square miles of the Capitol. All of them, dominant lion fisher, I mean, we, we are the lion share beneficiary of federal funded R&D. And all of the ability we have in the university system, not just to research and publish, to research and commercialize. And, and so we have to assert ourselves in terms of these national debates on the federal R&D tax credit and not have these stale debates about, once again, eliminating our own strategies here. These are the, these are the opportunities. I, I guess the, the long-winded point in the last 10 seconds is it's not that complex. We've overcomplicated some of these things. And we're sitting on a treasure trove. Entrepreneurial runs through our veins. Innovation is our brand in California. And, and it's just about, again, asserting ourselves and bucking up and taking the offensive as opposed to this constant state of reacting to the crisis, reacting to the critique. Well, and one last thing I'll get to, each, to everyone else is to say if there's one thing of hope that you're looking at right now, uh, what, what is it for California that you see as the big positive sign? And Peter? Um, the big positive side is like the, the willingness to take risks and the ability to be a visionary. Um, I lived for 10 years in New York and there's a lot of talk, a lot of finance there, but the willingness to just go out and do things. I'm a huge fan of, of the book Do More Faster from David Cohen and I think California embraces that and lives that more than any other place I've actually been. Kim? I think we have an opportunity, and Gavin just touched on it, to, to reinvent our education system here, K-12 through public higher education. Um, MOOCs provide, technology provides a, a tremendous opportunity now. We're seeing before and after, uh, before the MOOC and after, the results, the student outcomes being dramatically improved. One thing I think that we, that California could do, and again, this is about taking leadership position, is require computer science in, in as a, a, a standard course in K-12, in high schools. Only one in ten high schools actually teaches computer science in the country, and very few of those actually even have an AP course in computer science. We, we have ways now of teaching this content in much more engaging, fun, interactive fashion. Um, and by the way, the percent of women graduating with computer science degrees, again, nationwide, has is, is gone from 34 percent, a high of 34 percent in the mid-80s, to now around 12 percent, which like is elementary crazy. Elementary school. Elementary school. You should, you should start. In elementary school, you should start computer science in elementary school. There's no reason why kids shouldn't be learning how to program when they're five years old. Yep. And, and that would transform education, <laughs> that, just that one thing. Yeah, I, I will say that I, I finally remember my basic classes from when I was like six or seven. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, I mean, it really wasn't as great as logo and having the turtle move around the screen, but you know, but there was, it was neat to be able to do some of that. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, really the class of successful entrepreneurs, uh, that makes me have hope because I think they're getting in and they're doing a lot of angel investing. They're making huge bets, whether it's on a space program or electric cars like Elon Musk or Google trying to transform the way we drive and uh, glasses and so forth. I think uh, those are, those are going to create more vision for more people. It's, it's wonderful. That's great. Darren? Yeah, I think the, the greatest thing is we are the leaders. We, we are generating more IP. We're generating more patents. We've got a great workforce, entrepreneurial people. Uh, multiple nationalities, languages, cultures, uh, all in one place, which is which is incredible. I think for us, it's really uh, how do we keep it? And I think in a lot of things we said today were somewhat negative, but I think it's more in the let's make sure we don't you know lose the lead position. Uh, as they say up in Alaska, if you're not the lead dog in the sled dog race, the scenery never changes. We want that scenery. We want to be out front all the time. And I think that's what people are concerned about is that if we don't, if we rest on our laurels, everybody's going to come take our cheese and, and go move on. And, mm -hmm. and what do we have left? Uh, and so I think education, I mean, I've got three boys. Uh, my oldest is a junior. I'm looking at colleges. Most of his friends are going out of state. 
because of the impact of California schools. They're getting money from other schools out of state. You know, that makes me nervous. If, if all these smart, talented kids start going to other states, are they going to get some roots there and stay there and not come back to California? So I think it does come back to education. I think a lot of the success California had was on great educations that were relatively cheap, and most of those people fell in love with California and stayed here. So I think uh, we are the leader. We can maintain the leadership, but we've got to make some changes now to, to keep that. Yeah. We just got to get back in the future business. That's how, I mean, uh, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we were growing at 3.7% in annual growth. No other, no, no one else came close to growing jobs like the state of California. The last 30 years, we flatlined, we've become average. All the dust has settled, we've grown at 1.1% in the last three decades. The nation actually has outperformed us about 1.2%. So we've got to read our own history and start investing in those engines of growth, education, infrastructure, robust research and development, open immigration policy. If we're not conveying talent from our universities, we can always go out and get first round draft choices, the best and the brightest to come to California from around the world uh, and reconcile our regulatory environment, make it flexible and relevant to the world we're living in and address the issue of at least being competitive as it relates to corporate taxes, income taxes, capital gains taxes, sales taxes and the like. And I'll say this, that uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, being here today. And we have a very group, good group of panelists. And here at the Institute and at the California Center in particular, we do believe that California is, is not just a matter of potential, but the opportunities are still there. And the main issue is making sure that people can get to them and that we can actually take advantage of the, advantage of the positives that we have in place right now. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.